under the patronage of Lieutenant General Sheikh Saif bin Zayed Al Nahyan, UAE Minister of Interior and Deputy Prime Minister. The General Headquarters of Civil Defense presents the 5th Annual Fire Safety Technology Forum, UAE. Assalamu alaikum. Your Excellency, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, it is indeed a privilege to be here today and thank you very much indeed for the invitation. And also thank you for inviting me back to my second home. I have a lot of friends here, people in the blue light services that I've worked with and in other organizations, and it is truly a delight to be back here and to be able to say hello and see so many friends again. So thank you very much indeed. There's quite a lot I want to get through in the next sort of 40 minutes or so. Um, and during the course of that, I hope to dish out quite a few golden nuggets. So I see that uh, quite a few of you have got these notes or other pages, and there's a page for notes at the back. And I look forward to taking advantage of standing on this vantage point and making sure that people are jotting down a few things as we go through as far as those golden nuggets are concerned. Um, I'll go through a bit of an introduction just to make sure that uh, you've not got a complete blithering idiot standing in front of you and I've got a bit of credibility to talk about the things I'm going to talk about. Uh, I will certainly talk about understanding the command role because that's very important and interestingly, although I hadn't seen David's presentation before, it is a natural progression now to go into the things that I wish to cover. I will make no apology for emphasizing the importance of roles and responsibilities. And I look in front of me at, at these bright young leaders and commanders of the civil defense and other organizations sitting in front of me, and I shall be addressing many of my comments to yourselves. We'll look at some case studies. We will have the opportunity for questions later, and that includes if I'm walking around having a cup of coffee in the break, please come and speak to me. And what I would say to you is that sometimes things go wrong because technology fails. Sometimes things go wrong because people don't always do what they're trained to do. And sometimes things conspire together to create a particular major emergency. Thank you. Objectives January the 15th, 2009, and indeed, Captain Chesley B. Sullenberger did go in the Hudson. 
155 passengers and crew on board that flight, not one of them was injured. I've never met the gentleman, but I dearly hope I do one day, because he is a true hero. But I put that up there as a scene setter. Start thinking about the agencies involved in a multi-agency emergency of that nature, because there are many of them. Yes, there are the conventional blue light services, the fire, the police, the ambulance. There are various others as well. There were tourist boats that responded to that. There was an international interest because there was the Federal Aviation Administration and indeed their French equivalents involved in the construction, engineering and maintenance of the aircraft involved. So when we think about major incidents and multi-agency response, the first thing I would say to you is think outside the box. One of the first multi-agency major incidents that I ever went to involved the risk of petroleum spillage into a water course. And indeed, the gentleman that was there with all the amount of equipment and knowledge and expertise to prevent that seepage into the water course was not particularly listened to until it was a bit too late. Leadership and command takes on many facets. A quick skip through the credibility test. Um, I am now the uh, government's lead in relation to railway emergency resilience in the United Kingdom, and I make no apology for making quite a few references to rail transport in this presentation. Uh, I did 33 years in the British Transport Police, and, and I know I, I, these senior gentlemen are looking down here, are talking to each other, saying he doesn't look old enough for that. But certainly, 33 years in the, in the, uh, in the Transport Police, and came out at a rank sort of equivalent to Brigadier. There's a list of incidents there that I had involvement with, and I'll touch on Paddington in just a minute. Um, Ufton Nervet, uh, four days in the Gold Command after an individual, Brian D Drysdale, left his car deliberately on a level crossing, and it was hit by a train, and seven people sadly lost their lives. I spent some time in China after a high-speed train crash in Wenzhou, and three years as head of leadership at the police college at Brahms Hill. And I'm also very proud to say that I did a little bit to help the development of the Dubai Metro. The command role, and I address this particularly at the young gentleman in front of me here, is important. To be a successful commander requires leadership. I'll talk a bit about leadership in just a second and I'll offer you another golden nugget that you might like to scribble down in your book and have a look at when you're next in front of a laptop or a desktop computer with access to the web. You need to be able to demonstrate your competence. That means you're continually required to grow and to learn, to have the personality to take people with you. A leader is only as good as the people who follow him, and a leader achieves very little on his own. It is the strength of the team he is leading that delivers the successful results. Emotional intelligence, if you haven't heard that, scribble it down and go and have a look at it. Imagine that you have a satellite dish on your head, and that satellite dish is not picking up radio waves or television signals. It's picking up the emotions of other people around you, and in this context, I'm talking about the people that you are leading. Yes, there is a time for, I want this and I want it now, leadership. But there is also a time for recognizing that somebody perhaps needs to be taken to one side and listened to and find out why they perhaps are not performing in the way that you know they can and that they have done in the past. Emotional intelligence for a successful leader and commander is vital. Decisiveness. Folks, I run a four-day program on decision-making, and it is probably one of the most important things that I will make reference to today. Not only about being decisive, 
but writing down, recording the reason why you, as a commander at a major emergency, have made that decision. What evidence have you got that has prompted you to decide upon what you have done? Because if you record that rationale, that reason for that decision, then many, many weeks or months down the line, when somebody with the benefit of hindsight is reviewing that decision and asking you why you did it, you can turn around and say, I did it for those reasons there, because that is what I knew at that time. Decision making is vital and recording your rationale. And finally, as far as that slide is concerned, humility. Never ever be reluctant to seek advice, to perhaps apologize, or to say thank you to the people that are working around you. Now, I've lost count now, second or third golden nugget there is a, a previous American army general called Colin Powell. And he has written a leadership primer, which consists of about 18 or 20 slides, which are available on the web. Have a look at them, because they are as valuable to you as civil defense commanders as they are to any military commander or any police commander or indeed any commander in any walk of life. One of the things he says is that leadership can sometimes be lonely, and it certainly can. So, picture the scene. It's uh, 5th of October, 1999. It's a lovely, clear, bright, sunny morning. It's also the, uh, the day of my daughter's birthday. 1999, some of these young gentlemen in front of me will probably still be at school. But the lessons that I am going to talk about for the next couple of minutes from that day are as relevant now as they were back then. On that particular morning was the Ladbroke Grove train crash. Two trains collided head-on at a combined speed of about 130 miles an hour, just west of London. 31 people were killed, 520 were injured. When I arrived at the scene, that was what I was met with. This was on the back of around about 20 years of training and experience. This was after having driven along the Bayswater Road in a Peugeot at a speed of about 90 miles an hour when the lion on the steering wheel was getting bigger and bigger and bigger as I stared at it and said to myself, right boy, this is the big one you better deliver. And upon arrival at the scene, gathered a team around me, and yes, that was a time for finger pointing, and I want this, and I want it now. I want a police officer wherever there is a switch point. I want a police officer wherever there is a signal. I want a police officer wherever there is a driver's cab. I did not know how many trains I was involved with and I want a police officer wherever there is a, dis a, a deceased person, a dead body. And I wanted that to harness, to preserve the integrity of the evidence that those, those uh, parts of the scene would give us to help us try and understand how and why this had happened. Finger pointing, eyes like plates, like dinner plates, and I want it, now go. The senior fire officer there, I asked him if it was safe to, for, office, for police officers to go in. He said, yes, it's a bit smoky. If they inhale it, they'll cough for a couple of days, but they'll be okay. 
And so we went and did what was arguably a pretty good job. And the coach that you can see there, Coach H, bearing in mind that train was approaching London and people walk forwards at the end of their journey so that they can get off the train more quickly, we were fearful that that coach had upwards of 150 or 200 people inside it. It was burnt to a crisp. Fortunately, that was not the case. The one thing I did and that I would commend to you is during the course of all of that day, and I was, I was the silver of that for about five hours, just under five hours, and I was exhausted at the end of that. But I went round that whole scene four times, and there were a lot of people in there working very, very hard. And I had three questions for my officers who were in that scene. The first was, are you okay? Some of them have been standing next to dead bodies for four hours. The second question was, have you had something to eat and drink? And the third question was, do you know why you are here doing this? And folks, I'm delighted to tell you that on every single occasion, every time I asked that question, my officers responded with, yes. Yeah, I'm okay. Got a bottle of water and something to eat. And yeah, I know why I'm here. I know what I'm doing. And in your role as commanders and leaders, that's your job, to make sure that you ask those questions and get the answer in the affirmative each time. Next golden nugget. There's an American gentleman called Tom Peters who wrote uh, 1982, now it's still a good read, uh, a book called In Search of Excellence. And Tom Peters is a business management guru. And some of the things he says are really, really profound. So just listen to this one. Sarah Lawrence Lightfoot is a Harvard professor of sociology, half African American, half Native American. She wrote a marvelous book with a single word title called Respect. It was much later that I realized Dad's secret. He gained respect by giving it. He talked and listened to the fourth grade kids in Spring Valley who shined his shoes the same way he talked and listened to a bishop or a college president. He was seriously interested in who you were and what you had to say. We've all waited six months for the meeting with Mr. Big, and we get into the room with him with that five minutes that we've got, and he looks at us and he doesn't see us. He's looking over his shoulder at the next person, or his eyes are glazed. The definition of excellence in leadership is the person who, even if it's only for 30 seconds, is completely there for you. Now, a lot of us stand on these podiums and we charge a lot of money and we do our best to make life as complicated as we can. D. Hock, the Visa founder, simplifies life and gives you all you need to know about leadership. PhD in leadership, short course. Make a short list of all the things done to you that you abhor. Don't do them to others, ever. Make another list of things done to you that you loved. Do them to others always. So that's about 99% of what you need to know. If it made you madder than hell when you were an unempowered 23-year-old person, then as a 33-year-old manager, don't do it to somebody else, man. And if you follow that rule, you're about 98% of the way home. Make a list of things done to you that you don't like. Don't do them to anybody else, ever. Make another list of things that people have done to you that you do like. Do them to others, always. That's about 90% of what you need to know for leadership. When you're dealing with the kind of fires that David was talking about in the first presentation this morning, it will be your people that give you the results that you achieved the other day. And I commend you for it, because that was the success that David talked about. But it's all through people. The multi-agency interface can get quite confusing because I've got some very, very senior people sitting in front of me now. And I know that at a major incident, a multi-agency incident, there is a real likelihood that there's going to be a whole load of multiplications of people like you in their own professional field. This is not a time to be vying or, 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 or seeking 
to, to, to gain superiority. It's a time to be working together. I said at the start, I make no apology for hammering the issue of roles and responsibilities. Know your role and responsibilities and stick to them and help those others around you in command roles deliver their responsibilities. Otherwise, you get confusion. And this is not a time to have problems. You can fix the issues later in the debrief. This is a time to work together and practice. Practice, practice, practice. I hope above hope that I am never on an aircraft in the situation that we saw at the start. But if ever I am, I sure hope that Chesley is piloting it. He won't because he's retired now. I know that there are civil defense stations at every airport that I fly in and out of, and there's some great people in there, but I very much hope never to meet them because I don't want to be in that situation. But it's great to know that they are there. It's great to know that you are there. But practice amongst yourselves and with your partners because that will give you the results that you're seeking. I'll give you an example of that in just a second. One of the things that Tom Peters says is never let your ego get so close to your position that when your position goes, your ego goes with it. There is no place in command and leadership for ego. And the example that, that I'll just refer to there, the, the slide at the, at the bottom is the Clapham train crash, which was in 1998. A crowded passenger train crashed into the rear of another train, so that's two trains, and then an empty train traveling in the other direction crashed into those two trains. Three trains, 35 people dead and nearly 500 injured. The point I'm getting at is that the two senior commanders on that day were remarkably successful. The head of operations for what was then British Rail was a gentleman called Maurice Holmes, who was an incredible character, and he was an extremely tall man, so he carried tremendous persona with him. He was also very, very skilled. And the commander from the British Transport Police was an assistant chief constable called Ian McGregor. And what was said by Mr. Justice Hidden in the subsequent review of that incident was that although those two men knew each other, they worked very successfully together, they actually maintained a professional arm's distance from each other which was correct, it was totally professional to do that, but they knew each other and they worked well together. Practice, practice, practice. Now before I reveal the next slide, I'm just gonna give a bit of an introduction. This is when it goes wrong. This is an example of not getting it right. This is in um, 2003 in Switzerland on a highway between uh, Lausanne and Geneva. The G8 conference was taking place. The world leaders were in Switzerland. And some protesters, for whatever reason, decided to barricade a major highway, a six-lane highway. And they tied a rope across the highway and then dangled one of the protesters, I never get this, 23 meters off the rope, off this bridge, and another one, 23 meters this side, and in the middle, there's three lanes of highway. Now, this is not about the protest, okay? Don't focus on the protest. This is about the response by what should have been trained professionals. <laughs> One policeman who has just arrived on the scene walks up to the rope. He gets his knife out and is about to cut it. A protester and another police officer move in and stop him. <coughs> the police are just waving the car drivers on. Nowhere do we see them talking to any of the drivers, asking them to drive slowly or carefully. This 
this officer walks straight past a senior officer. Without talking to the policeman holding the rope up, or checking in any way, he cuts it. And Martin Shaw fell 23 metres, broke his back, and had a range of other serious injuries because, yes, because there were, but also because there was no control, there was no structure, there were three different police forces there, the military police, the traffic police, and the local provincial police. Nobody was talking to each other, nobody had a situational assessment, and in the end, one individual took it upon himself to take action, which resulted in a nine-year legal battle. It's quite easy to get it wrong if you don't follow the rules. That's why we have a set of procedures to help us get it right. And most of the time, we do get it right. Many of you will have seen that before. In terms of major, major emergencies, major incidents, putting it in context, things go wrong and there is the initial response right at the start. When everybody goes rushing to the scene, they break through hopefully any confusion and, uh, and, and get some structure in place, particularly around communications, and there is the consolidation phase of that major incident. Now that may take many hours. Then there is a recovery phase making sure that casualties are, with, are withdrawn, making sure that the fire is extinguished, making sure that any loose debris or structures are secured. Then there is the investigation phase. And then, of course, there is the situation to return to normality with all the other events that take place, including investigations, inquiries, and then latterly, uh, any um, anniversary events or things of that nature. The, the tried and tested structure for that, which I'm sure will be very, very uh, common to most, if not all of you, is the gold, silver, bronze structure, which one or two of you are nodding in, in, uh, in agreement and you know clearly quite well. But irrespective of the scale of the event, that structure can still work very well indeed. Those pictures you're seeing uh, from Oldgate reiterating what we're now being told by Scotland Yard, that this is a major incident. The emergency is a major incident. Still only being said that there are several people injured, though clearly from eyewitnesses' reports on the ground, there are more uh, injured than have at the moment been accounted for. The latest on the travel situation, the whole of the tube network has been suspended this morning. Mainline train company First Great Western has said its services into London's Paddington are terminating at uh, Reading because of the underground crisis. And it is also possible, British Transport Police are saying, that two trains are stuck in tunnels at Edgware Road and there could still be passengers on board. We know passengers have smashed windows of tube trains with umbrellas to get out. We didn't know how many trains we'd got. At one stage, we thought we had had six or seven explosions. It transpired that we had had fewer than that. But still, on that fateful day in 2005, a total of 52 innocent people lost their lives. It was an enormous incident across London, calling upon the training, resources, command, leadership, and interagency activity of virtually every agency you can possibly think of. But the point I'm getting at, ladies and gentlemen, is we had one gold, one silver, and various bronzes of, of which I was one. Gold was Commander Chris Allison, an extremely experienced senior police officer from the Metropolitan Police, and that's his job. Set the strategy. And if I had a little bit more time, I'm absolutely certain that you would be able to come up with the strategy that Chris Allison prepared. Because it was about dealing with people and helping them and rescuing them. It was about gathering evidence to find out who's done this. 
It was about trying to find the people who have done it and hold them to justice. And finally, it was about trying to return to some kind of normality. Trying to deal with the fear that people had experienced. One silver, Roger Gom, very good friend of mine, cometh the hour, cometh the man. And that's Roger's job, to put into place the tactical plan created by gold. Deliver the plan. Make it work. Make it happen. And appoint your bronzes and put them where you need them to be. It might be at hospitals, it might be at railway stations, it might be wherever there is particular sources of evidence. That is Silver's job. And of course, bronze is the individual or are the individuals who put into place the operational plan that has been directed by gold, firmed and set by silver and done by bronzes. Now, there's something else that we have recently introduced in the United Kingdom. Some of you may have heard of it. If you haven't, this is another time when I'm looking to see some pens going in that book that you've got. Because the other thing that we have introduced in the United Kingdom is the Joint Interoperability Programme. This has come about as a result of events such as the King's Cross Fire in 1987, such as the 7-7 bombings in 2005, such as the floods that David showed the pictures of in his earlier presentation, and such as the atrocities of a man going uh, on the rampage with a firearm in Cumbria. If you have not seen the Joint uh, Emergency Services Interoperability Programme, JESSIP, then Google JESSIP. There is a raft of detail and information there which will be of use to you. Uh, it's a I think it's a two-year programme. I'm pretty sure it's a two-year programme which is promoted by the government uh, to help the interoperability of the emergency services and other agencies across the United Kingdom. I've got one publication there, and I'll quite happily leave that here if somebody wants to have a look at it. What does it all look like when it works properly then? Daylight revealed the full extent of the West Coast mainline crash with an engine flipped over and nine carriages forced off the track. Such was the impact of the 95 mile an hour accident that the train left tree trunks like broken matchsticks on the embankment. Rail accident investigators have turned their attention to why such an incident should happen on a straight piece of track on a line which has seen millions of pounds of investment in recent years. And the focus of the inquiry has emerged quickly. Having a set of points immediately prior to an accident always makes those points very suspect. And uh, given the information that we have and examining what we've been able to examine so far, that's the focus of attention at the moment. But if it is a points failure, that would be the responsibility of Network Rail. Clearly, there is a possibility that it has been something which has occurred, um, which Network Rail is responsible for. But and indeed they were. It was a points failure that resulted in a train travelling at 95 miles an hour to leave the tracks and resulted in the death of one lady, Margaret Masson. And it is indeed remarkable that not more than one person tragically lost their lives. But in terms of multi-agency major incident response, what I want to focus on is the scene because this truly was in the middle of nowhere. This is actually where I, roughly, where I am from in the United Kingdom. It's a rural area. It's in the northwest, affectionately known as the Lake District. And if ever you get the chance, do please go there, because it doesn't normally look like that. It's normally very pretty with lakes and mountains. The emergency services and their multi-agency partners needed to construct a highway to gain access to the scene. And here is the road that was constructed. Here is the nearest farm. And these good people responded to the crash. They even got to the stage of taking curtains down from their windows to provide blankets and some kind of comfort to the victims from the crash. Very challenging scene, very challenging indeed. 
But my question to you is this. There is one building there which is quite a bit larger than the others. You might not be able to see it very clearly, so I've pointed it out to you. And that building was larger than any of the others. Would anybody like to have a guess at telling me what that building was used for? Say again? It was not accommodation. It's a, it's a good suggestion because it could have been because we were in the middle of nowhere. I will tell you, folks, I did not go to the scene of this, but I'm proud to say I did train the first commander who went there. So what's that building used for? Say again, sir. It wasn't command and control. Now, that's interesting because you would think that an event of that scale had the largest building set aside for those who were commanding and controlling it. Quite right. But no, it was not for command and control. Shout up. Canteen. It wasn't the canteen, if only. I can't hear you. It wasn't a warehouse. The largest building for an event of this size. Come on, you bright young somethings down here. It wasn't the mortuary. It wasn't sheltering. No, it wasn't triage. These are all good suggestions. Thank you. Who said that? The biggest building at that scene was to cater for the voracious needs of the world's media. We saw at the Oban Bridge in Switzerland the power of social media. Everybody, I've taken my phone off my belt now because I'm trying to be professional, but everybody is now a journalist. They all have telephones with goodness knows what kind of technology in them. And that building there was to satisfy the requirements of the world's media. When you're dealing with a major incident, a multi-agency event of that nature, don't forget the media. Now these things, that was, I've, I've made reference to events that have taken place many, many years ago. So hey, these things don't happen very often, do they? Well, they do. There are two events there from just the last few months in railway-related multi-agency major incident terms. Germany and Switzerland. And the point I would say to you there, folks, as I draw to a conclusion, the point I'm saying to you there is that these are effectively well-known as safe and secure orderly societies, very much like yours. But things still go wrong, and not just in Europe. And we begin this noon with a developing story. We are learning more about that commuter train crash in California this morning. Our Dave Lucas is at the ABC7 Live desk with what we know. Dave? Jimmy, the truly remarkable thing about this is so far no fatalities. Take a look at the video. This is the crash site in Oxnard, California. It's about 65 miles to the northwest of Los Angeles. The Metrolink commuter train crashed into a truck and derailed early this morning. At least 30 people have been reported injured, two of them critically. Three train cars tumbled onto their sides and into a nearby agricultural field. The National Transportation Safety Board, we are told, has just launched one of their GO teams from our area out to California to lead the crash investigation. The train, at the time, was headed from Ventura County to Los Angeles. And it turns out this isn't Metrolink's first disaster. In the last decade alone, 25 people were killed September the 12th of 2008 when one of their trains hit a Union Pacific freight train head-on. The engineer was texting at the time. The engineer was texting at the time. Doesn't go down too well for professional sort of um, uh, image, does it, if one of your train drivers is using a, a mobile phone at the time. But I want to leave you with this. In 2009, there was a train crash in Washington that resulted in the driver and eight passengers being killed. Two trains collided, one ran into the back of the other. But the response to that was magnificent. Your opposite numbers in Washington all responded in a professional way. People knew what they needed to do, and they did it. And they did it very well. The challenge is this. They hadn't had an incident since 1996. 
as commanders and as leaders, the challenge that I bestow to you now is what are you doing to make sure that your people are continually refreshed, motivated, and able to respond to incidents of the type that we have seen? What are you doing to network with other agencies? What are you doing to absorb what they had in Washington a decade of not needing to respond? Colin Powell talks about the formula of P equals 40 to 70, in which P stands for the probability of success, and the numbers indicate the percentage of information acquired. Once the information is in the 40 to 70 range, go with your gut. Because with your experience, with your training, with the people that you are leading, go with your gut at that stage, and you should be right. Thank you very much indeed.